But more broadly, I suppose, and this is one thing Terry pointed out to me, that as a result of the work that he and um, Terry Sainovsky, that, that he did with Sidney Leckie, there isn't really anything in the world that corresponds to white. And yet we have a representation of white. It's something that the brain constructs. Brains also habitually, constantly represent goals, plans, projects. And the thing that is represented does not yet exist. So when these really quite wonderful accounts from the information theory people are offered to us as an account of how neurons process inf or code information, it has to be remembered that those counts, accounts, one and all, depend on the idea that the neuron is responding to an external stimulus. And it often, and perhaps importantly, almost never is so. Uh, oh, sorry, I want to go back, if I may, please, uh, and back one more. One more back, back, there we go. Um, the issue of spontaneous activity is not unrelated, and I'm, I'm, I'm going to go very fast through the rest of these. But um, one of the things that has now been a question that people are working on is, so what is all that activity in the resting state? So when you put someone in a functional MR and give them a task, of course, what you're doing to get those wonderful pictures is subtracting from the baseline. So, or you're subtracting the baseline from the experimental uh, condition. So what is all of that spontaneous activity? And Mark Rakel's group has discovered that there really are two kind of systems that we wouldn't really have known about save for this kind of work. And that is that there is one system that is more active during the task where the other system tends to be less active during the task, and then the reverse in the resting state. And there are certain parts of cortex then that are more active during the resting state, and they also seem to be ones that one may speculate or are involved with such things as self-reflection, planning, envisaging the consequences, imagining what might happen, considering what might be the spatial layout, and so forth. But there is a huge amount of spontaneous activity, and of course we also see it at the single level, cell level, and, and we really don't know what that's all about. We don't know how the organization of the motor response is achieved. We don't know how there is integration. This was already alluded to earlier as the binding problem, but we don't know how integration across sensory systems or integration across sensory systems together with memory and giving uh, giving a, a motor response, we have a, really a clue how that's done. And within memory, well, there's been beautiful work done on individual cells, uh, the LTP work and beyond. But how is memory orchestrated across a network? And as Sydney raised the question this morning, how is it that, as it appears, information is initially held in the hippocampus and somehow gets transferred to the cortex. I mean, that's, that's not you know, just a sort of one single cell to one single cell. It has to be uh, a large scale maneuver. We have no idea how that's done. Okay, and then we'll go to the next one. I'll leave off functional organization for the moment. Time management is a problem that is very deep um, and we've really only begun to address. And I won't really say anything about that now um, because I'm running out of time. We don't yet understand, <laughs> sorry, uh, we don't yet understand why it is that we sleep and dream, although it's fascinating to discover that the humble fruit fly also shows patterns that are describable as resting and active that look in many respects like sleeping and being active. And finally, we really don't yet understand many of the fundamentals of how information is stored and retrieved. 
an intense amount of work, of course, has been done on declarative memory and the role of the hippocampus. But skill learning is clearly a very, very critical part, as I suggested earlier, of how cognition works, and that it remains very, very poorly understood. My own sort of hunch about these things is that there, there are some really fundamental sort of, I, I hate to use the word paradigm shift because it's, it's such a cliche, but that we are really in for uh, a very different way of looking at the brain and how it builds this model within this, in this meat. It builds this model of the other world, of the external world. It cannot have direct contact with the external world. It's all mediated. And somehow it builds a model of the external world and builds a model of itself as acting in that external world. And I think we just, there's something very deep about that. And I, not, I don't think it's philosophical. I think it's neurobiological. And I don't think we've quite got a grip on it yet. Thanks very much.